Okay, Janet, it's your your talk. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for inviting and coming to me. Uh, Televogue is something I stumbled upon when I began my uh, initial research for the first book I wrote called The Using Affair. And at the time, um, and this is actually almost 29 years ago um, when I stumbled upon the story, I just decided I would have it in the background because I was grabbing everything about the resistance and things that happened to ordinary people during the occupation. I thought, well, this would be interesting to have in the background of my character's life. But over the years, I have discovered that Televogue not only was a major war crime that was heard at Nuremberg uh, trials, but was the beginning of probably the total breakdown of the resistance um, during 1942. It's a year when they talk about the roll-ups of all these uh, resistance groups um, that were started in um, you know, from the very beginning. And these, I always call these groups organic. It's like, let's get together and let's do something against the Germans. The British are slowly becoming involved in bringing trained people. That's but my case is definitely uh, a thing. So I'm going to start. And people should be muted. Maybe you could mute them except for me. Yeah, everyone should be muted. I will. So anyway, um, this is Televogue, the like geese of the North. So we all know that um, the basics about the invasion uh, into Norway on uh, April 9th, 1940. And it was a major attack, a really stunning attack that so many different uh, places were attacked technically really on the same day. It's an ama amazing story. And you know there was resistance. Well, many different places. Narvik was one of the places that was like the last. But uh, after France fell, the war was pretty much over. And uh, any people helping, the, they were British, French, and Poles helping Norway, and they withdrew. And so now we're occupied. And King Hulken and the government are all in England. And right away, even before the final fall uh, of Norway, uh, Torboven is already on hand as the uh, as the Reich Commissar for Norway. Um, and uh, he was a personal friend of Hitler. He was brutal and detective, and he had command of six thousand men, including the secret police. So this is him on the left. Um, there's uh, Quisling, and this is you know, this is Reese, I think his name is, and he was quite bad too. And here is a talk. This is, I believe, is the university. You can see Terboven speaking, but down here is Quisling. Quisling will not become prime minister uh, until 1941. Um, so from the very beginning, people were escaping to England and the Scotland, the Shetlands, and we've had a talk a couple like about a year ago of people actually rowing to uh, get away out of Norway. And this is a very typical kind of boats that became part of the, the North, this North Sea traffic. Um, one type is called the Mori um, Cutter, and there was another style that the very sturdy boats that could make these North, uh, North Sea uh, jogs over to mm -hmm. Scotland and England. So right away, uh, in the very early days in 200, refugees, and we remember that there were British soldiers who were trapped uh, in Norway once everything collapsed, and they also went over to the Shetlands. And uh, after a while, it's like, uh, well, let's go back. So to give you an idea of where uh, the Shetlands are, here's the Shetlands, here's Bergen, here's Trondheim, and this North Sea traffic went as far as up here. Uh, up to uh, Vikna, which is north of Trondheim. But you get an idea that um, it's in the middle of nowhere. And when I go there this June, I'll be leaving from Seattle to uh, Heathrow to Aberdeen. And then I take a little putt-putt over to uh, the Shetlands. But in, uh, you know, it's very close. It's only 870 miles, 77 miles to really the closest of Bergen's very close. 
And so in that November of 40, uh, Major H.L. Mitchell, he arrived in the Shetlands to organize these uh, fishermen that are going back and forth, taking people, uh, get, helping them get away from the Germans. And I think by the time, by the end of 1940, um, <clears throat> maybe even the beginning of 41, uh, they established a 40 mile fishing limit. So any fishing boat going past that 50 mile limit, uh, they could be blasted out of the air <clears throat> by the German you know, Air Force. And the other thing too, they had to start carrying a sign saying under the pen of death, if they were caught, they could be arrested. So it's tricky, not only going across the sea, but you also have the Germans watching constantly <clears throat> this uh, 50 mile um, limit. So the first um, organized shuttle cup was called the Shetland bus. The Norwegians called the Shetland gong. Uh, gone in, I think is the correct word. And then the first one was established up here in Lunavo. They thought this was a good place. It's, uh, I'm going to find out how bare this place is. <clears throat> but it was a little, um, Vo is a, another word for fjord. Um, and they were established up there. Uh, nobody was there except I think they had a church and a house and maybe a few people and a lot of sheep. And they thought this was a good place to go. But by the summer of 42, because uh, they only ran during winter. So uh, by the summer of 42, you know, the light is bright. They call it the simmer dim in Shetland. And so they would, um, they were reorganized and they realized that we've got these, a lot of them, there are fishermen that are part of this team. And uh, they realized that they really needed to give them some place where they, when they were not um, going across the sea, some place that had a town and, you know, maybe they have a girlfriend or something like that. So they moved them down. And the interesting thing on about the bus is that they had like two officers who were British and they let them in among themselves. Maybe you're, this is the author, I think, right here. Um, and they, would, they could have their name, their own skipper for their boat. And they were kind of in charge. They had one Norwegian cook and that was it uh, for the bus, but they moved to Scalaway. So here is Televogue. Where is Televogue? Well, Bergen is up here. <clears throat> you can see how tight it is. And actually German warships would go up through here into Bergen, but you would take a ferry uh, down to Televogue. Televogue was right off the right on the coast, it had 150 people. And in 1940, it had a brand new schoolhouse, a youth center and two shops. There were no cars on Sotra. This is the island of Sotra. And uh, they did have a car and fell. And the car uh, was pleasant. It was known as the Plum because it was purple and it was a little taxi. But there's no way that you could get um, to Televogue unless you went by ferry. So today I'll be able to drive across uh, either in a tunnel, probably go to this island down and then drive down. I'm taking a bus down there. But it, uh, it was this next, very close to Bergen, which I spelt wrong, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was easy to drop and pick up people there. So the Tellers of Televolk. So amazingly, just a month after the German invasion, Lawrence Teller and his son Lars, they start taking refugees over to Shetland. And uh, this is um, this side is the east side of a, a fjord here, and uh, this side is where the town was. And uh, so what's amazing is from um, 40 to January 42, they believe at least 136 to 50 people fled to Shetland via, via Televoke, and then agents came back with arms. And I have a wonderful friend who's from Bergen. She's 98 years old and very sound of mind. And she lived in Lassevog, which was right where the U-boats were built in Bergen. And she said, oh yeah, you know, one of her neighbors actually just quietly went away. And she knows they went on the Shetland bus, probably in the early 1940, 41. So uh, agents came back. So the group now organizing this, um, they, um, they would send over agents and they were often hidden in the, tele, uh, the telehoma. 
And back then there was no bridge. You had to uh, show, show up on the shore over here. The road is up here. And you would come down and someone would row you over. So Lars Tella, this is Lars Tella and his wife, Anna, they were married in the thirties. And um, this is their home of Lawrence and Martha Tell's home where the, they were hidden. Another group involved with this, and I hope I pronounce it right, is Uber Tweets and Carl Nippen were also involved in North Sea traffic in Tel Aviv. And Uber Reit often hid agents or people trying to escape to the Shetlands. And many of these refugees were on these hit lists um, that um, were being sought by the Gestapo. So looking at the year 1940, where um, the incident Telebo will take place, is looking at what's going on. The Germans are really starting to crack down. Remember, um, Quisling has only been a minister probably for less than a year. And uh, in February 5th, the teachers went on strike against the order to notify the school. They were supposed to join the special um, union of teachers. And uh, they said no. And the paper was passed around and 8,000 to 10,000 signed up saying they're not going to do it. And then on, um, I think it's March 20th, 1942, um, male teachers were arrested, sent to Greeny. And from that group, they were sent up to a concentration camp near Schirkenes in the Arctic where they did hard labor. The word did get out. And even as they were um, moving up, on by train to go up to this um, place in Shirkiness, people stood out along the railroad and welcomed them and wished them well. So the other thing that's going on in February is this group. The Wally Export Group is out of Ulusan, and they had a very good group that were moving people back and forth from Ulusan to Scotland. Um, then on uh, February 23rd, actually on the, 20, the 23rd, a group of refugees um, were trying to get out. And this is the first action by Henry Oliver Brennan, who's in Trondheim, his first successful infiltration of a resistance group. Uh, the group originally were late getting to their, um, their starting point, and they, had, they, they were told to go back. So this one boat was going to take them to another boat that was going to go over to Shetland. And the group... Um, went back to their original place, uh, which is in a little fjord. It's just to the east of, um, of Ulusan. And four people got off. Uh, they decided they were not going to go after all. The others remained, but two agents got off. And that night, um, everyone was arrested. The four that never went, they were never found. And this will have a connection to Televog later on when more agents are exposed. So the other thing going on in March is Article 2 against the Jews. This is when the Jews were taken out of the, con uh, out of the Norwegian constitution. But earlier in January, um, people of Jewish faith were already being required to have a J on their, their identity card. So that's what's going on. Uh, during this time in 1942, the Germans are starting to, the fall down of the Wally Group, part of the North Sea, you know, Shetland bus thing, was a first kind of indicator. The um, head of Mielorg and his family left immediately from the Ulysses area, and they ended up in Shetland. So this is, um, this is Tullavog today. So what does it look like? Again, here is the little, uh, little town of Televog. This part is called Nippen. And actually, this is a huge, rocky area here. And uh, you would come up this way, stop here, ask to be rowed over, and then you would contact. If you wanted to go, you would contact um, one of the Tellus. This area is called the Course Fjorden. And I've seen a movie where the Shetland and bus actually went all the way up here and deposited some of this arms and ammunition. So um, I wanted you to see this because my understanding in about 2000, a lot of the World War II records were released and some of the stuff that was released was this. It's a whole series. I've just cut out a little section, but to give you an idea, these are the actual notes 
uh, handwritten to show um, how how the bus works. So um, it looks like this. It shows the trip. The name of the code name is Anchor, and uh, it shows uh, it's going to go to Televoke, which is near Bergen. It's going to leave on the 21st of February, and it returned on the 25th of February. The boat is the Olaf. Here is the skipper. And they're taking um, landing one person, and it goes on and on and on. It's showing. So on February 21st, the Olaf left the Shetlands with Agent Thor Galbrinson on board. And the original plan was to drop them off at Marstein uh, Lighthouse. So if you've looked at the fjord there, the course of fjord I'm showing there, it's outside and up along the coast is where this uh, lighthouse was. And they were going to drop them off there, another drop off place for the Shetland bus. However, the lighthouse was on. And this is not what you usually saw because all lighthouses were blacked out. But they later learned the warships to Canal South and the Prince Ugin were being escorted to Bergen. These huge, big, massive uh, battleships were being coming into Bergen to be based there. So they kind of went into the Course Fjord and dropped them off, and they went back to Shetland. But this gives you an idea of how uh, they kept track of the different operations. So there's many stories about how, how the um, Tellas were discovered. And, this is the best one. There's a wonderful book um, written. It's in Norwegian, it's in, but translate action in um, Televog that someone gave me. And um, the the official one, it's from the museum there in Televog, is that it began with a dispute over a boat that uh, Lawrence Tella had sold. And, you know, it was in good shape, but uh, not, you know, a couple months after he had it, it sank. And, uh, the new owner was not happy, and um, so, and he wasn't getting, he wanted the insurance to be paid for. He wasn't happy. It's an interesting idea that you have insurance during an occupied country. It's almost like it's normal. But uh, he went all the way up to Fell, which is right here. So here's Telefog. Here's Bergen. Uh, he went up to Fell, um, and uh, he talked to uh, Pierre Lai in Fell. And uh, when he was told the problem wasn't that urgent, we're not going to go over to Televol, which is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he said, uh, he added, well, Tele has a illegal radio. Whether that was true or not, we, I don't know. But he also hinted about illegal trafficking. Where with it. You go to dog park? So, um, you want to go to dog park, hmm? You want to go? Johan Bergen was a member of the Stapo. He came to Fell. I did not pronounce names correctly. What? It's, re it's annoying. What? This woman was uh, this Norwegian expert on this Norway. She doesn't pronounce people's names correctly or, or towns. Come on, you want to go? Yeah, they have a lot of money. You want to go, go to Alpha? I'm going to continue. Thank you. <laughs> Johan Bergen was a member of the stop who came to Fell by ferry to see Lai on April 24th. And he came as kind of a, dressed as a man on holiday and partly because he had a rucksack on. People just assumed he was an Englishman looking for a way back to Scotland. He was told the Shetland bus had just left days ago. One thing Bergen knew was that um, he was suddenly across in the boat and he was being introduced to Lawrence Tell at his home. And the story is that while he was there, he heard uh, someone moving around overhead in the house. So he was invited to meet them, but he didn't do that. Instead, he went back to Fell. So this is what he didn't know. He didn't know that another, the Olaf had returned again uh, to Televog, uh, Televog down here. Here's, um, and he had um, he had uh, brought some agents with him. So we have um, these two gentlemen here. It left on April seventeenth, and it dropped off Lindy Company, Lindy Linga Company agents Arna Virum and Emil Val in Televog, along with ammunition, weapons, and explosives. And then it returned. So they were actually hiding upstairs uh, when um, 
Berg, where this gentleman showed up from Fell. And uh, with him upstairs was um, the 14 year old son, uh, Olga Tella, who was a son of Lars and Anna. So um, it was reported that there was something going on there. Uh, we need to go and investigate. So on the April 26th, at 4 a.m., um, Johann Behrens and a deputy commander, uh, Bertram, arrived by a boat with 10 other German officers and some NS police. They surrounded the home and there was a gunfight uh, with Behrens and Bertram were killed. They actually went up into the bedroom where the two agents were. And um, the agent Behrens was killed almost immediately and then Hobble was seriously wounded. And people on the east side of the um, fjord didn't, they heard stuff, but they didn't know what was going on because there's a boat, they weren't going to go over there and they were, they were saved. The scary thing is that while all this was going on, Oga was in that room and he reported later um, that bullets just went right by his head. That's how vicious the fighting was, but he wasn't hurt. So that night, um, uh, 12 people from the village were taken to Bergen for interrogation and torture. Among them was Lawrence, his wife Martha, and their son, um, uh, Olga. The rest of the villages, the men were put in a barn. The women uh, ages and children ages four months to 97 years of age were put in the youth center. The men didn't think they would last the night. I mean, it was, must have been terrifying. So when Terboven learned about these agents being killed, he really went into rage. And you can see because what was happening already in Norway, there's this tension, the teacher strike going on. And actually the church was also protesting, I think in beginning in April, they were having none of it, of uh, things being Nazified. He decided they made, need to make a, a, an example of this village. Remember this village, 450 people. So he came to Tel Aviv to see its destruction. Here he is standing here, and he's standing over here. He came to oversee it. So on April 30th, uh, all the men, 16 to 60, left in the village, were arrested and sent to Bergen. And this very famous photograph of the men. And about several years ago, uh, surviving members um, were in a uh, TV show uh, and tracing the steps. Um, by then, they were elderly men, but restrict, you know, restrict, uh, showing again this famous photo of them leaving. So most were sent to Greeny, but eventually uh, they all ended up in Schatzenhausen. And of the 72 deported to Germany, thir the 31 of them died in the camps. Lawrence Tella and Joseph Overtree remained at Greeny. And um, it's kind of interesting because they were like the leaders, um, but the village was punished. Seven of those arrested were named NN um, prisoners as Nakam Neville. Um, and they, this was a way of no trial. You just decide someone's face and you could shoot them and there'd be no record of them. Uh, typical Gestapo um, um, thing to do. Lars Tella and Agent Hubble, they were executed. But look, they were executed almost a year later, which is really terrible. Uh, remember the, uh, the guys that were captured trying to get, leave from Olesen? They were uh, at Greeny and they were um, shot and killed in reprisal. So word did start getting out, not till the, um, the summer outside of Norway, and it was starting to be named the Lydis of the North. And ironically, Lydis happened about seven weeks afterwards. And that was a horrible reprisal. I think it's Czechoslovakia, but Lydis uh, was horrible. They not only blew the village up, they killed every living person in that village. So on May 1st and 2nd, everyone left in the village was arrested and held in the community center or the boathouses. So we have 270 women plus, and he had a 12 week old to uh, 97. And some of the elderly were bedridden. So they were all wondering again, what is going to happen to us? But on May 2nd, the women had one hour to gather what they had with them. They were loaded into boats and sent to Bergen. 
a Norwegian Red Cross bus met them and took them south to Fauna. So here's Fauna down here. And I have a spy map from 1942 built by the uh, British Naval Institute. And this actually is, I think it's 19 miles. It looks long, but actually it's a port, a very uh, short um, run down there. So at first, all the women were housed in the Stortetweet school south of Bergen. The Norwegian Red Cross looked after them, but the German soldiers guarded them. So this is the first night. And uh, there were so many rumors what would happen next. They didn't know what was going on with their husbands. Would they all end up at Greeny too? And so uh, there was just, it must have been horrible, just not knowing anything. You're worried about your kids. Uh, and you're worried about the elderly women. It was just not a very good thing. And the strange thing is during this time where these women are down the house, the men are on their way to Greeny, there was a huge funeral for Barons and Bertram in Bergen. Um, they had, um, I don't know, people, they were friendly, the Germans lined up, but um, maybe people were forced to come out and watch, but they had a, a big parade for the two um, German agents that were killed. This is the train station, I think, in Bergen. So a few weeks after this, um, all the elderly women were sent to Frommis um, Jungdom School in uh, Hardanger. And um, they were there for just a short time when uh, it was announced that all the women with children under the age of six would be told they would also be sent to Frommis. And if you had a kid that was under the age of six, you would be with your mama. But if you had also children that were seven to 10 to 15, you were staying behind. Uh, these are the children, the babies that were up at um, this area here. So here's Bergen again. They're more into the interior. And I, I found this. And so it, 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 was, it did become a war crime. People started hearing about this. But I wanted to show you this because um, in Washington, D.C., they had an official newsletter that was started actually in uh, 1942 called News of Norway. And um, you have to figure out how do people get word? Well, you're going to get word of mouth. You're going to have people not telling the whole story. So there's a lot of stuff in here that's not quite right. I show this to the curator at Televolk at the museum there. So some of it is right. They laid waste to the fishing village of Sotra near Bergen for killing of an officer and his aides. It says there are only three houses are left and the other 79 burned to the ground. And yes, this is the number of people because there are 450 people that were homeless. And Terboven was there. Uh, an official had appealed to people surrounding countryside to come and melt the cows at Televog. I don't know about that one. I do know that they shot all the cows. They shot 60 for each one of the Germans that was killed. Um, and I don't know about uh, this young man being shot. So again, this is how do we get information out about it? This was what was published. Um, yes, they did bring all the men um, to 60 and they were separate and said they actually went ahead of the women. Um, and so it just shows you uh, some of the information is, is correct and some of it, you know, how do you get word out, you know, when a place is occupied? So the children over at uh, the age of six remain in a store street. And uh, during this time, there was, um, a, it came to light that there were plans by the Germans to separate the children and mothers and send the children to orphanage in Southern Norway as orphans. And then this rumor started that they uh, would be sent to Oslin, uh, Germany. So enter Conrad Elias Birkow. And he was a doctor uh, in the Bergen area. He was born there. And then he went to the US where he attended medical studies at Johns Hopkins University. And he trained there as a bio, um, bacteriologist. 
Later, he studied the Pasteur um, Institute. So he was an expert on tuberculosis, and he returned to Bergen in 1937. During the war, he became the leader of the Red Cross and, um, in Western Norway. So he often did go check in on the women and children at Storbeat. And I think if you show the previous uh, slide, you see them lining up for their shots. So when he heard this, that the older children might be separated from their mothers as orphans, but really sent to Germany, he actually introduced a bacteria, diphtheria um, into inoculated kids. So he was aware of those kids who were uh, inoculated and those who weren't. And of course, when you think about this, you think about the doctor's oath but, um, and they actually did a, a show on him, I think a year ago uh, in um, Televogue about what he had done to save these kids. Cause I don't think it came to light until maybe a few years ago, but um, it saved the kids because um, Germans for some reasons were totally freaked out about any kind of illness. And there's uh, stories of atrocities of them freaking out and actually burning people down because they were sick. Um, burned down the barracks. It, that actually happened in northern Norway, but that was under an NS group. Um, but anyway, uh, they stopped. Uh, he stepped in and did this radical thing, and the Germans said, you know, kind of forget it. So they were all allowed, uh, united uh, with their, their mothers. Everybody was with their mothers. So now they're all united in uh, this part of Norway. And during the first fall there, 29 women received notices about the death of their husbands or sons. I think by then they knew that their, um, they were, the men were all at Schatzenhausen. This is a side note because a couple of years ago we had a talk on the, on the Horton gang. So this is the gentleman that was brought in on the the um, Olaf just uh, a couple of months before uh, it came back with the two agents that led to the atrocity in uh, Tillavog. So he was a SOE agent and leader operation anchor. So his name is on that um, handwritten form that I saw you. And he's the one that they decided to drop him in Tillavog because they couldn't go by the lighthouse. And he went, he moved into Drummond, his hometown. And he went by the code name of uh, Stora Thor. And he was supposed to meet up with one of the agents. They think it might have been Havel, but um, they don't really know. But somehow the Germans found him out. They think um, after the reprisal at Televog, um, his girlfriend had friends at Televog. So somewhere along the line, he was arrested in a shootout. And he was then recruited by the Gestapo to work as a double agent. He didn't know he, I think they, they thought that he was you know, gonna be easy to have. He's wounded, he's uh, isolated, but the information he gave away compromised many resistance units uh, in and around Oslo, including Horten. So you can see they struck in July 29th and Oslo, Drammen, Konsberg, um, and Horten. He later escaped uh, and he ended up backing, uh, being about allowed back into SOE. So here he is with Jack Wilson. Jack Wilson was the head of SOE Norway. So it's just an aside, but um, it's a complicated aside. So back to the men in Televog uh, who are now in shops in Hausen. 72 men from Televog were sent there. Uh, many died the first year. That's why the wives were getting uh, notices uh, about their sons and husbands and others pretty horrific time there. And, um, you know, seeing people hang, people being pulled out of line and shot right there, these terrible things were happening. Um, one saving thing is that they could receive packages from the Swedish Red Cross. And by liberation, so the women who were detained in from this were released in 1944. Most moved back to Sund the southern district of the island of Sotra, but they were not allowed to visit Televog because there really wasn't anything there anyway. And then during this time now, because, you know, um, Paris has been liberated, we're moving along into 45 
and through the efforts of folk uh, Bernadotte, um, he made an agreement with Himmler uh, that the remaining Telburg men um, could come back uh, via the what they call the white buses. So the Swedish Red Cross, as the war in Germany is winding down, um, we're still like a month away from the actual liberation and um, of Norway. Um, they were still able to get um, men out. Uh, Lawrence Tella was released from Greeny on May 9th, 1945. And actually that's the day when the British officially came in to help surrender Norway to the Germans because the Germans did not want to have anybody from the resistance um, having to surrender to them. So they waited for the British to come until May 9th. All the families were united, but there were still hard times. And many of the men passed away you know, because of the poor health the first year back, and others had PTSD and other mental problems. So what happened to Telebog after the war? Well, this was became a symbol of resistance and also resilience. So um, Telebog was brought before the Nuremberg court uh, and um, as you know, it was highlighted as one of the war crimes against ordinary people during the occupation. And after the war, um, Germany also paid compensation to the surviving people in the village. It took four years to rebuild the village. Various financial organizations offered money and help. And what was interesting, um, King Hoken and uh, the Crown Prince Olaf took great interest in seeing the village restored. There was kind of like a contest to uh, have uh, various architects design um, new houses. So they designed a total of 73, 43 barns and other structures. And barns, I would think, would be the, the fishing, um, you know, fishing houses that were built right on the water where they could, uh, the boat houses where they could put their boats and, and their gear. And this was finally done in 1949. And here's an example of the first house going up. And so um, to conclude, um, very early on, I was reading a lot of poetry. Many of these things were read over the BBC uh, channel to Norway. And this poem was written, I think, uh, not long after Televog by a poet who uh, he was able to get to uh, England and eventually the US. And I think he actually worked for um, the Information Center in Washington, D.C. But this is a poem. It's a very long poem, but this is the ending of it. And I have this in my novel, The Quizzling Factor. My life turns to memories. All my thoughts are gone. But one thing is burned into me. This we could have never done. Just out of hatred, take a child from its mother. Bertrand butchers 60 cows for one dead soldier. Take the old men and kill them with torture that drives you mad. Burn down poor people's houses, all they ever had. This is a monument that's near the museum in Tel Aviv. When the prison boat pulled away, everything that children got is deep in them to stay. Behind the seductive face, the traitor's outstretched hand. They shall see in the glimpse of their dead father in Tel Aviv that burned. And these whispers of children, the dream takes on its power, and our Norway lives waiting its hour. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. It's a uh, very good talk, uh, very interesting. I learned a great deal. Um, and um, uh, but this was, how successful was that in deterring uh, the resistance? Was that fairly successful or not? Well, you could see that for the rest of the year, a lot of places were exposed because what had happened. So, but definitely, I think by the uh, turning around towards November of 42, things are starting to get really organized. There's more support for helping See, a lot of Mueller groups were rolled up. They call it rolling them up, and they, they were all exposed all over. I've talked to people. They're not long past, but I met a couple, um, Jan Ullison, who lived in Ferndale, Washington. Um, his wife's family were all captured for uh, 
you know, taking um, British um, parachutes north of Trondheim and all the, everyone was shocked. So it was really vicious in 42, uh, but I think um, the group, the groups regrouped and they realized that you just can't decide, you know, who's going to, let's put a group together. You need some more organization and they're coordinating now with Oslo. And one of the things that came out of Televogue is that the British weren't always talking to the local groups and that's how a lot of people got exposed. So I believe by the end of 1942, both Milord, which was the military organization, and SOE Norway, the British uh, organization, they're talking and coordinating. They say it was a lack of coordination that could have brought on this, uh, this tragedy. But it may have been happening anyway, because like the first group, the Olesen group, the Walla group, uh, when they were exposed, then the Germans are catching on it. This is an organized effort to move people from Norway to uh, to Scotland and Shetland. And of course, they're being trained in Britain under SE Norway. They're training people how to be to be agents and how to support the effort. Did the Germans end up going to the Shetland Islands? You know, uh, if you there's a great book about the Shetland bus that was published in the 1950s. It was among my first resources, and apparently there were they were. That's one of the reasons why they think they moved from Lunavo. They felt they were a little more exposed, so there were there were incidents where planes were fall that far out, and you know, I think a couple of times boats were sunk by Germans. So. Uh, they began to know the existence of that place. And just think about it, you're in the middle of nowhere, and now you have to go to Scotland, so you're going to have U-boats, all kinds of stuff's going to be happening out there. This is, uh, unfortunately, uh, the issue of war crimes is, uh, unfortunately, in the news today with uh, uh, Russia and the uh, Ukrainian invasion. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess it, it's sort of an important issue, particularly the people who commit war crimes need to be held uh, accountable for them, you know. And it's... Well, that gentleman that came from Feld, you know, discovered them. He was arrested and tried. Um, I honestly can't remember what happened to him, but he was put on trial then, I think, sentenced to something. I don't think he was executed but there were others you know that were um you know germans and and enablers you know quislings that were put on trial too mm -hmm. but yeah you know that thing with ukraine and the children i mean that rings really true how uh, the germans were often taking children and because they were the perfect aryan mm -hmm. you know race and often kids did end up uh, being adopted by uh, german couples or couples that were, you know, married a local woman. Yeah, it brings really brings back memories. <laughs> Has anyone heard of Televogue, or is this sort of something new to everybody? I, she has a hand up, yeah. Uh, so I have. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify something first because of what I heard, I think seems incorrect okay. based on your research. So I, I first I heard the story that pretty much all the men and young boys were killed straight off. But that that sounds like that that did not happen. That's not, yeah. That's not correct. Yeah. And, and I knew about the women being being sent somewhere else and that there. But OK, so the men were mostly were any was. It said there was one person that was shot yeah, right away. Lars, Lars Tella was shot, the uh, young man, uh, the okay. son. Uh, he was shot right away. Well, a year later, he was shot. And okay. I think there were some others. They talked about disappearing. Um, you know, I had, uh, I've been in touch with the curator at Televog, so he helped me, you know, make sure. Because one of the stories I heard a long time ago was a disgruntled woman who heard about people getting packages, you know, from overseas. And he says that's not true. The true story is that uh, this en encounter of um, this gentleman coming from Fell, he was really coming from Berrigan to check out this rumor, you know, that there might be illegal radio. They had no idea agents were there. And that was what led to the 
the gunfight, they they thought they were just a bunch of yokels that were doing this. But no, no, these guys were well trained. They were from Linga Company, and they they knew what they were doing. Right. And the other, my other comment on it was that um, I always thought this was, you know, I have I've not very young children, but I have children in school age. And I always thought this was a good example of when they asked them, would you be in the resistance or would you not? Maybe not Norwegian resistance, but in general yeah. during the war. And that you're not really just maybe signing yourself up. It depends. You're, it's not just a, such a black and white decision because you could be committing your whole village to being burned right. and losing. And so I, I did... Um, go to my child's school and I've tried to ask if, if they would like, I even tried to explain what I knew a little bit about Televog and I brought it up to other people. And I, the overwhelming response I get is um, dis, it, at the lower level disinterest mm -hmm. at the higher level, almost going bordering on like, okay, nobody has said this, but almost Holocaust denier type thing, because I feel like the impression is nobody wants to hear that civilians were actually affected and killed. It, it just seems like this, there, there was not, you know, women in any camps or same, same with women's camps in Poland. Don't want to hear that, that right. there was, you know, Ravensbrück. They, so I have not felt that I got a very um, welcoming response to to having this. And my, my husband happens to be a historian and I, so it wouldn't like I would give the, I asked if they would like somebody to come in and give a talk um, and they're not not interested. So, and and brought it up with other people, not, not it's against the narrative, not interested. So right. that's just been my experience. I mean, I hope more coming out about it. Maybe people will get a renewed interest in it. Yeah, the anniversary is coming up, uh, you know, the end of uh, April. I think it's the, what is it, the 80, will be the 81st anniversary of it. So it'll be, um, that's why I want to go there so badly. I'm going to have to hire someone to take me out there. The, the bus buses are a little weird. But I definitely am going to go. Um, so I think the idea, too, is that a lot of people don't think anything happened in Norway. They're... Um, that's why the novels, you know, have really resonated because people go like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, and uh, actually I have a member, um, I belong to the Daughters of Norway here in Bellingham too, and one of the members' father was a prisoner number 10 at Greeny, and he was arrested because his brother had the audacity to flee to, uh, to England, he became a member of the RAF, and he was arrested because his brother was gone. And he spent his entire time at Greeny. He was, uh, she said he was uh, 20 years old. And when he came out, she said, she talked about, her parents didn't talk about it. They eventually immigrated, I think. Um, well, they ended up here in the Washington state, but that was a jump from, you know, moving across country. Uh, but she said they never talked about it, but her dad um, was in a, uh, a Nordic rest home in Seattle. And he was very hard of hearing. And uh, when the staff would, uh, he couldn't hear them knocking on the door. So when they come into the room, he would start yelling at them, calling them Nazis, because he's reliving what he went through trying to survive at Greeny. You know, yeah, it's, it's hard, but if people don't think about Norway, they're always surprised. You know, I knew a long time ago the prince, the, you know, the crown princess was staying with the Roosevelt's. I learned that a long time ago. And again, that's a surprise. I didn't know that, you know. So uh, it's good to talk about it. Um, and certainly with the stuff that's going on, you could see why Norway joined, you know, joined the you know, United Nations and NATO immediately. And why there's a tension now, because they know, they know what it was like. Uh, to be occupied. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. The. Uh, yeah, it, it's. Bergen uh, has his hand up. I think. Oh. Anyone? Um, yeah. Oh, Jorgen. Yes. 
Yeah, I, sorry, I was a bit late. I was sitting here and suddenly I realized that you guys had already started, so I lost the beginning of that. But um, uh, very interesting. There was a comment here a little bit earlier, and unless I, I didn't hear the whole thing, about the Shetland bus and, you know, they're moving the base and stuff. They had a, they had a number of ships. Uh, by 1943, they lost a lot of mm -hmm. these... Uh, Shetland buses, <laughs> which were mostly fishing boats. Uh, and uh, it became all unsustainable because they were, I don't think so much uh, submarines, etc. but of course, planes, they were easy prey for planes. And that's when uh, they got these two, uh, it was actually subhunters from the Royal, from the US Navy. Mm -hmm. And they took over. So that when from 19, I guess, I can't remember exactly now, just late 43 or early 44. Yeah, I think it's 43 um, they started. Yeah, the, because that was the, the tough year when they realized this fish, the time had run away from the fishing boats. Also because the German planes had better radars and all the other good stuff. So my dad went on, on one of those uh, sub hunters and they didn't lose any of them actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a great success because they could go back and forth during cover of darkness. And that was the problem with the, uh, with the fishing boats. They may start out when it was getting dark, but they wouldn't reach the Shetland Islands before uh, the next uh, dawn. So um, it's just a little comment to that part about the, the Shetland. Yeah, well, any kind of corrections, I'm happy to hear because, you know, I'm still, in a way, still learning. There is an NKR film about Televolk. You can hunt it on uh, YouTube. And they actually, um, I think both the Obertweet went to Schatzenhafen. They, they walk all the way through it. And I think they're interviewing Oga, who's in his 80s. I think the film came out a few years ago, but I watched it. You know, I'm still learning to be a listener. I, I will not open my mouth speaking any Norwegian. I'm still learning, <laughs> but I'm getting pretty good at reading and actually hearing. And uh, it's, there's no subtitles, but they walk all through the beginning of the incident to the very end. And so several members went to Schatzenhausen, you know, like back in maybe early 2000 or 2005, and they went to see where they were and to watch the emotion on the survivor, um, you know, on their faces actually seeing the stuff and telling what they saw. I mean, it was very very emotional. And again, you know, um, like I said, my friend's father, 20 year old at Greeny for his time because his brother had left. And I've talked to other people who have had similar stories with relatives. So to me, it's an honor to write about this. Um, I try to get my facts correct. I'm telling a story, but I'm trying to make it accurate uh, because I want people to know. I have a wonderful narrator too now for uh, both Quisling Factor and Yusing. And his father, his mother was in the Norwegian resistance. She was Miss City of Oslo in 1937. And she got involved with the very early stages of resistance. Again, when I talk about organic, it's a bunch of people getting together. And when her radio operator was killed, uh, she left by 41, so she missed this huge roll-up. And then she met Chris's dad in Scotland, and he was an RAF pilot. So Chris's book is coming out this um, this June, but it's really fun. He never spoke Norwegian in his house. He grew up in Canada and in UK back and forth. He's a UK actor. But he said they never spoke Norwegian, so in order to get pronunciation correct for my novel, he would FaceTime with his cousin in Oslo. <laughs> he said, I'm going to get this right. <laughs> but I'm really grateful. But I, these little stories people come up and tell me, even when I was in Trondheim, you know, five years ago, people came up to me and they said, you know, our parents never talked about this. And they kind of lean in. What do you know? Well, I'm still learning the no. But, um, yeah. I just want to mention one little piece of information for all of you that uh, um, I don't know exactly when it was, but all the archives in Norway are opened. Mm -hmm. So you can now log on. Uh, I don't have the website here. I can find it. Uh, let, log on. And for example, you can see all the boats that went and all the people who went with the Shetland bus yeah. and 
you wonder if some of your relatives or distant friends uh, were on that, you know, you can check that out. They have every, every name there. Yeah, I showed earlier if you didn't see it. Okay, I, sorry. I, I, well, I actually, no, I actually showed the little type, you know, written up hands about the, how it was written out going because that was made public too. And then someone, there's a couple of good sites that list all the boats and what happened to them. You know, um, some of them are pretty famous. The author's, you know, the author's pretty famous. So, yeah, it's an amazing story. And, you know, I went across the the channel when I was a student. I got violently ill. I also got violently ill when I class studied abroad in France in 66, 67. So we came back to cross the Atlantic to Nova Scotia, then down to New York. We were violently ill. I mean, they were singing, playing tea for two at 10 o'clock and giving out bullion to every single passenger on that place. So you think about these boats going across the North Sea from Shetland in some of the most horrible weather. The, the skill, you have to really admire the skill, especially the guys in the early years with their fishing boats. You just have to, What well, that's a cool thing. And you know, some of the early stories are hysterical because some of them in the early years, they go in and go, one guy went to a dance. You know, and then they were picking up agents and went back. That was the early years. That didn't happen later on. But uh, but Televolk, it's, I'm, I, I think it's important to talk about it, you know. I had a, um, like, you might have said this, and I know you showed, like, one of the clippings that might have been a little bit inaccurate you had mentioned. But I was wondering, um, in your research, is it more that, the Germans kind of kept what they did there hidden, or I, I always was thinking they would exploit that, right? To stop resistance movements, like use it as an um, example, like we're making an example of the people in Tel Aviv. And that, did you find where that was somehow pushed into any type of media so that, that I know we saw that one clip, that one thing, but was that being spread out to uh, Norwegian, towns or or even beyond Norway to to try to use that as an example I, I'm not sure well Jürgen has said in the past that initially the Germans wanted to kind of get along with the Norwegians they thought we don't want to cause a lot of trouble but I think because of the teacher strike and all these other things that are happening and then these two guys are shot that's when they really pounded. So it, like, it took a while for the outside world to hear about Televogs. I don't think they heard about it until August or July in the News of Norway thing. And I, I don't think, I, I looked at a lot of Newsweek and um, what's the other one, Time Magazine. Um, I have them up here at my local university. And I was surprised that Norway was almost mentioned every single week in Time Magazine. And so when I'm researching for this novel a long time ago, no one knew about it. It's like no one knew about Norway. It's all about France and about Poland, you know, North Africa. They didn't know. But back in the day, the day, Time Magazine and Newsweek had some kind of something or other, something happening. I don't recall Televolk. It's just sort of general, general stuff mm -hmm. that's going on in Norway. So I think it was an example that Norwegians may have heard about. But again, remember, this is an isolated little fishing village so um if they might people may remember the funeral thing in Bergen if you were in Bergen but did they know about it in Oslo or do they know about it in Trondheim you know in Trondheim I think March 5th I'm reading it now 42 five men in Trondheim were shot for radio having a radio so the Germans are starting to get really 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 pushing. And then, you know, the big incident in Trondheim was the arrest of prominent people in Trondheim. And then they shot 10 of them. And Terboven came up on a train and they had a big party at which uh, Henry Oliver Renan was present. Everybody got drunk and then they shot these prominent people. There's, they know they were dropped off. Um, in fact, their names were erased they did not want anybody to know about it because that was another war crime. It's listed as a war crime. So, um, yeah, I I think there's Norwegians are starting to, you know, resist. But um, Televog, I don't know how why what why known it was outside of Norway. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, I, um, one thing was that, it, as you mentioned, I think it's mentioned, there was a difficult decision to decide if you would support the resistance because you were not just putting your mm -hmm. own life in danger, you were putting your whole family's life in danger. And um, I was talking to some people and they mentioned like uh, one of the relatives was in the resistance and they didn't want to talk about it at the end of the war because uh, maybe perhaps that would cause problems within their family you know it because they would have been upset that they had put their everyone's life in danger and it's a hard decision and it's mm -hmm. not something where you can just uh, uh, have a nice formula to say what's right and wrong yeah, one of the things that I learned, and honestly, I forget his name, but he's one of the top people in the resistance. People were mad or south of Trondheim because they blew up one of the mines, and they were mad at him. And after the war, they were mad at him because we lost our jobs. You know, so it's complicated. You know, but I'm reading right now that uh, the the mayor of Bergen in '42. Uh, resisted the uh, arrest of the um, teachers. That was the final line for him. And he was kicked out at the end of March, 1942. And uh, they brought in a, you know, a national Somling guy to be the mayor. So the politics are starting to get really tough in 42. So hard times. I, you know, the rationing is going to start getting harder. Um, the, the issue with the Jews is so sad. You know, some were able to actually get out via the Shetland bus. Some were able to get into Sweden, but a number were left behind and they were all rounded up by November 42. And they were all killed. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Norway had a very small, barely 2,000 Jews in Norway. So, and that's another, that's another tragedy that happened uh, in Norway. So, well, we are also um, just uh, uh, Wendy. Um, uh, we are having Jerry, um, and I want to make sure I got your name pronounced correctly. How, how do you pronounce it? It's Pugnetti, unless you're Italian, and then it's Pugnetti. <laughs> Pugnetti. I will go with the simpler one. Yes. Uh, Jerry yes. Pugnetti uh, wrote a very nice, uh, also, we had, uh, you know, Janice written some great, two great novels on the uh, resistance and working on a third. Jerry wrote a very uh, great novel on the resistance, and which I've uh, had a chance to read. They're uh, different, a little different perspective than uh, the Janice, but both are very good. And Jerry couldn't be with us, but he is. Uh, he has uh, sent his editor. Uh, yes. <laughs> and you want to talk, and he's going to be talking sure. at our um, April 30th meeting. And uh, I just wanted to know, Wendy, you want to talk a little bit about his book? Sure, sure. I'd like to do that. And, you know, just and, and to emphasize again that the, the comment we get over and over again from people who read the book is, we didn't realize that any of this happened in Norway. And I'm you know, I, it's it's nice to know that Janet is out there with her education, and we hope to add to that. But I I was what he refers to as his in-house editor because I'm his wife, <laughs> and uh, I have a background in writing as well. So um, his book, A Coat Dyed Black, is a historical novel about a farmer working the family farm from sunup to sundown on the west coast of Norway. And um, then the Nazi Germany invades and his life is turned upside down uh, like every other Norwegian. And the story transforms him from, uh, from a farmer into a highly trained resistance fighter out to help uh, take back his country. It's a very personal story for us uh, it is actually based on true experiences of my father and his Norwegian family and others outside the family. Uh, based on years of research, um, great many interviews with family members and other others in, in Norway, as well as um, later here in the United States. 
uh, while the characters are fictional, uh, they are modeled after real people. Um, and the book's description of what happened during the five-year occupation is historically accurate. Uh, when, he, when Jerry, who goes by the pen name Don um, Pugnetti Jr., uh, when he joins you in April, he, he'll be talking about how the book came about. It's a um, quite a backstory that goes along with it. And um, he'll also cover some of the history of the warriors and Nazi tyranny and brutality. And thanks um, to Janet, because now knowing what territory she's covered, he'll certainly be able to try to um, cover some some complimentary and different angles. Okay, thank you. And we're looking forward to the talk um, and uh, uh, give it best to Jerry. Um, we'll do question uh, from, um, question is, uh, was uh, Shetland safe if one reached there or was it rather isolated from the mainland as well? Um, you sort of touched on that a little bit, didn't you, Janet? Yeah, I think in the like one of the best books is Shetland by Haworth. He was the second in command uh, of the Shetland bus, and it was written in the 50s. You can get a call. It's a great book. I mean, what an adventure. But he does talk about it several times, how close German, because remember, 187 miles off the coast, you know, really Bergen's the closest one. Uh, that's not too far to fly if you have a good plane. So they they did harass and uh, they were concerned. I think I think maybe actually a U-boat kind of came close to there. So he details it quite well. It's a great book. You should read it. So I finally went out and got my own copy. And I got the spy books out of uh, my Western library. <laughs> they're, they're extraordinary, the British Naval Intelligence. It's crazy. You can just check it out of your library. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, any uh, last comments or questions? Hear me? Jerry? Yeah, uh, we've got Jerry Pugnetti coming to speak at our lodge in person uh, next month. Oh, oh nice. In Bremerton, Washington. Oh, great. wow. That's and great. That. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a little harder to get him out uh, to Washington, D.C., but uh, maybe we'll be able to get him out there sometime, along with Jack. I'd like to trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to work out something. Okay, great. So I can thank you, everyone, and uh, great talk, and we will be putting this eventually on uh, YouTube, so um, if you want to share that with people, and we'll be uh, hopefully sending out the links uh, on our uh, next email and we'll be looking forward to seeing everybody on April 30th. So great and have a great day and uh, enjoy March Madness. <laughs> oh yeah. Go, go, Gonzaga. <laughs> and I guess no one has a, a no. Un, uh, no one has a perfect bracket this year. So yeah. yeah. Uh, any last comments? I would like to know the name of the book again. I didn't of Wendy's book? And, uh, the one that about they were talking when Jerry had written. Right. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, a, it's a coat. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. It, it's a coat dyed black. <laughs> a coat. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you'll enjoy it. It's very good, along with Janet's book. They're thank also you. very good. So, thank you. And you have know, a great week. Okay. Bill, hold on a sec. Somebody has a question. Oh, okay. Go yeah. on. Yeah. Um, it's Jeannie. I, I'm from our Bundeland at Lodge, but I, I did want to thank Janet for her talk. And I thought it was very interesting about the uh, doctor who saved the children uh, administering diphtheria. But the other thing I just wanted to say was um, the I just wanted you to know that the 17th of May parade in Brooklyn this year, um, that's on uh, May 21st at 1.30. But the theme, the theme of it this year is remembering Norwegian resistance. Mm 
Oh wow! Oh good. So they have they have a nice pin. I just bought it up at the uh, at a board meeting, and uh, a nice gold pin that says "Remembering Norwegian Resistance" that they're selling on their website. So you just go to the Norwegian American Parade in Brooklyn, and they have all the information. Oh. I'd like to get one. Uh, May 21st. Yep. <laughs> okay. This one quick other thing. This is Marie uh, Hansen from Washington Lodge. Um, the the um the book, The Shetland Bus, and probably a coat dyed black, but I think both of those are in our lodge library. I can't vouch that they're there, you know, they might be checked out, but um you might want to check the library sometime when you come. And the other thing is in the next newsletter that's coming out, um, I didn't know about the pin, Jeannie, for, for resistance, yeah. Yeah. for something to my resist um, with the resistance theme, but I did know about a t-shirt that they're selling that we're going to have in the newsletter with a link so you can buy it if you want. And it's a really neat t-shirt. It's got a paper clip on it um, and oh. the Norwegian flag and something about the resistance. Yeah, and, and, and also tote tote bags. Tote. I think tote bags also for sale. But. Yes, and a tote bag. So, and I think we also have Janet's books in the library too. Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. I thought everybody knew that. Okay. <laughs> well, and we also sell all of them at the at the Christmas festival. Yeah. If you want. yeah. <laughs> but that's a long way off. It's a long way off. And actually, I hope I can come to one of the lodge meetings. I may maybe after this year when I get back this big trip that I'm taking, okay. but I might be able to come. My brother's in Boston. We're trying to finish out my parents' memorial. Mm -hmm. so maybe this fall. Maybe. Well, you're certainly welcome. Okay. Thanks. And uh, everyone have a, have a great week and, and enjoy the sports and enjoy the good weather. So thank Thanks. you for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay.